The name Shinar is something you should be familiar with. It's a biblical name, and we have an expert here to talk about it today. And his name is Dr. Michael Lake. Michael Lake, welcome to Prophecy Watchers. It's so good to be here today, Gary. Can I call you Mike? Please. All right. Let's get down to business. We mentioned Shinar. It's a word that probably most Christians have heard. They know it's a biblical word, but that's about it. But you've written a book, and I'm going to hold it up here. It's called the Shinar Directive. It uses that word prominently and China is more than just a little minor word in the Bible. It's, it's really a concept, right? Shinar is basically the seed uh, that was planted, I believe, by the kingdom of darkness for everything that we're seeing today. It is ground zero for Babylon. It's ground zero for the mystery religions. Uh, it's ground zero for the Luciferian elite. And we find it's Genesis. It's interesting. It's in the book of Genesis because it's the Genesis of the end time one world government that's going to be established that we're quickly racing toward. And to understand where we're heading we've got to understand what happened in Shinar. Let me read from Genesis chapter 11 and and it begins in verse 1, and the whole earth was of one language and one speech. Now this is after the flood. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east they found a plain in the land of Shinar and they dwelt there. So there it is, the start up after the flood. Everything, the water had receded, people are trying to get some kind of lifestyle back again and regroup, and they come to this place called Shinar. That probably wasn't an accident. No, it wasn't. And really even to understand chapter 11, you have to understand what happened in chapter 10 okay. with Nimrod, because everyone was attracted there because Nimrod was there. He became an occult magnet for the populace that were already beginning to reject the God of Noah, the God that had done the judgment. They already began rejecting that. And so he began to facilitate uh, the building of something that was going to oppose the God that had judged the earth. Now, in today's parlance, uh, Shinar would be a, a place name, and Nimrod would be the name of a little known character. Uh, he's called a hunter in the Bible. <clears throat> and today when somebody goes out and hunts and fishes he's commonly referred to as a Nimrod. Uh, maybe a Nimrod is someone with less than the normal amount of common sense. But it, it's a word that has been diminished in our era. That is to say it's yeah. not a power word at all. And to be truthful I think part of that is uh, cultural veiling of his significance. Uh, within the Luciferian elite, whether it's Freemasonry or the many different branches, uh, he is esteemed. He is, he is the philosopher's dream. He is the, the alchemist's hope for mm. uh, transmutation. Mm. That he was able to achieve something that I believe that even the watchers of Genesis 6 were not able to achieve. In that he was a, he was a full-grown male that was able to become a, a gibberim or a giant after his birth. He wasn't born that way. Like when you see in Genesis 6 they either did it in vitro or whatever and once the, the individual maturated they, were, they became giants. They just kept on growing. He, he was able to, he discovered something that they're hunting for today. Uh, he, is, he is what the transhumanists would call their, their absolute prototype of what they'd like to achieve. Well let me uh, just read Genesis 10, uh, 8 and 9. <clears throat> Cush begat Nimrod, and he began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter, it says in the King James, before the Lord. Wherefore it is said even as Nimrod the mighty hunter before the Lord. So he's got this title, he's a mighty hunter. What does that mean when you bring it into our language? And <clears throat> in, if, you, if you're reading it in Hebrew, Literally it meant that he got in the face of God 
and begin hunting and drawing men unto himself and away from God. So everything that he was establishing was a system that would basically capture the hearts of men that they would no longer follow the Creator himself. Mm-hmm. Um, in fact, where we see here that he, be, he became a mighty one, that word in the Hebrew is gibberim, and it's the second time it's used in the Word of God. The first time is in Genesis 6 where the Nephilim the, when the Bene Elohim, the, the uh, watchers came down and cohabitated with women, and, and the Nephilim became gibberim. Whenever you use the principle of first mention in the Word of God, this is God giving us the basic definition. That the definition to become a mighty man was a Nephilim. Now after the flood, it, we see it again that Nimrod was able to replicate something in his life. Hmm that to be a mighty man, now it, when you follow the etymology, David is referred to as a mighty man because of his exploits. It didn't mean that he became a giant, but it, it kind of fades over, over time. But this concept of becoming a gibberim is the reason that Nebuchadnezzar thought he had to become a god and God had to judge him, or Caesar believed that he had become a god. Hmm. And they had, they had the worship of the, of the emperor. That all goes back to Nimrod and what he became in, at the Valley of Shinar. Now you really need to pick up on this idea because it goes all the way through the Bible. And, and uh, as I was talking to, to Mike before the program today, it goes all the way to the Antichrist, still future to us. And so we have here in Genesis 10 uh, the origins of Nimrod and his occultic, if you will, supernatural method of trying to pump himself up, making himself some kind of a demigod perhaps. Mm -hmm. And then that's followed by chapter 11 of Genesis where men got together in the land of Shinar and began to build a tower. So Nimrod and the tower are connected. Absolutely. And go into that for us. You know when, when I used to, before I really got deep into the study, I used to imagine that there were a few primitive people out there throwing some rocks together and got 10 feet high and God got mad and you know, <laughs> uh, did his thing. But when I began to follow the research of Edersheim and, and many others, I was shocked to find that uh, where they were building around the Tower of Babel was bigger than the size of London. That it had a wall around it that was this shy of as high as the Great Pyramid of Giza, which is one of the few edifices that was able to withstand the flood. That uh, it was so vast, this one city was so vast that he had 12 palaces so that no matter where he was conducting business within that city he had his own palace. And in the middle of that was the Tower of Babel. That was, that was his crown jewel that they were, they were attempting to do something. And I, I believe one of the reasons that um, the wall was as high as it was, was because if God, the only way that they understood judgment from God was a flood. And so if it began to flood again, those walls would give them limited protection until they could finish the work that they had started. Now, there's a statement here uh, in chapter 11, verse 4 of Genesis, uh, and they said, go to, let us build a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven, and let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. In other words, the whole purpose of this tower was to reach to heaven. Now, I've seen, you know, the the Empire State Building and some some of the places in Dubai, you know, that run a thousand feet high. That's a tall tower, but it doesn't reach to heaven. These men wanted to build a tower to reach to heaven. What does that mean? I think it's not what we would normally consider. They weren't trying to build a skyscraper. I mean, you can go to Dubai and you can get so high up you can see the curvature of the earth. <laughs> you know, so... <laughs> yeah. um, <clears throat> But and, and as well as if you're going if you're going to try to reach heaven, wouldn't you start on a mountaintop? You don't you don't do it in a plane. Right. Uh, I believe that when uh, Nimrod became a gibberim, uh, that it enhanced his perception. That very possibly there was a thinning of the veil between uh, the first second, the first heaven, second heaven, third heaven, or dimensional. That there was a possibility of opening up a dimensional portal there. And so that's the reason that he built. I believe that there was probably leftover watcher technology that he was trying to implement 
even in the building of the Tower of Babel. Perhaps it wasn't the height of the tower that's being talked about so much as the structural type. Structural type and position probably. And, and the position on earth, uh, perhaps the, the proper latitude and longitude, a number of different factors that those ancients knew about that would enable them to open a portal. That's what Mike is suggesting. Yes. The Lord's reaction, and I'm going to read uh, a, a couple of verses here because I want you to comment on this. The Lord uh, came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men built, and the Lord said, Behold, the people is one. They have all one language. And this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. So this is God's opinion of this project. He, he's, he took it seriously. Uh, we're not talking about some fantasy here. We're no. talking about something that God reacted to. And that's amazing to me. In fact, when you read it in Hebrew, it, it, when he said they, they were of one language, it literally has a picture of almost the tongue to the ear that not only did they have the same language, like in America we can go all over, we all speak English. If you've ever been in, in, a, in let's say, England, they speak English, but their English is vastly different than ours because there's something called dialect. Yeah that can skew understanding. What this is saying in the Hebrew is they had not only the same language but the same dialect so there was never any misinterpretation of anything spoken. In other words they have one mind. One mind, a hive mind. Wow. <clears throat> and so what happens? Verse 7 says, let us go down uh, and there confound their language that they might, may not understand uh, one another's speech. And out of that came uh, Babel, Babel the idea of the confusion of tongues and so forth and so on. But the original idea of Babel was the unification of man into one spiritual uh, thrust, if you will. And Babylon itself literally means the gateway to God. And so uh, they had their original intent of what they wanted to do. And because of God's judgment we have, we have kind of turned Babel into incoherent language or, or something of that nature. But what they were building they had something completely different in mind. And I believe that when God confused the languages He did not destroy the plan. He simply postponed it. And that's why I, I call the book the Shiner Directive. I believe that Nimrod and his counsel, those that the, this is the genesis of all mystery religions. He set a directive for a, a long game plan for them to fulfill the vision that he had. Babylon at that time was the only world government. He was establishing it as the, uh, the only monetary system, the only religion. We're seeing the world gravitate back toward that because the bloodlines and the, and the philosophies that, that came out of his directive are all pulling us back to that very same idea. And what I have discovered about the Luciferian elite, they always look at the long game. Uh, it's not what they can do maybe over one generation, mm -hmm. but maybe what they can do over 50 generations. Uh -huh. And so they, they kind of just, this, we end up becoming the, uh, the frog in the, in the kettle as the water's heating <clears throat> up and not realizing Slowly but surely. That, uh, that they have an end game. The book is The uh, Shinar Directive by Dr. Michael Lake. And now that we've established a base for our conversation, and the base is in uh, Genesis 10 and 11, and he's explained rather thoroughly uh, the groundwork for this massive occultism really that, that's worldwide. It's a global phenomenon. It has been. It goes all the way back to Nimrod himself. It's never quit being what it is, right? Absolutely. And your book then brings us right up to the present moment, starting with Nimrod and going through a series of iterations, governments, etc., and and showing us that, hey, what what began then is still going on today. Not only going on, but I think on steroids. Wow. Uh, one of the universal symbols for the unfinished work of Nimrod is the trapezoid. Of course the Masonic altar itself is a, is a, a trapezoid re reflecting that work. The unfinished pyramid on the back of the one dollar bill is a, is a trapezoid which what's interesting in the occult trapezoids also, also uh, pull and get the attention of demons and pull demonic power. I think because it sees, it lines up with what Nimrod wanted to do and begins pulling in power for that. 
Uh, even the meditation room, uh, I document this in this book, the meditation room at the UN in which they have this steel altar that supp- and they, they actually quote the Bible that they, you know, they turn their, their, pl- their swords into, into plowshares and mm-hmm. stuff. Yeah. The room is shaped as a trapezoid so here you have all the world leaders going in that room to meditate under an occultic uh, symbol or shape that attracts demonic power to inspire them to complete that direction. So you're saying the, the shape uh, of, a, of an enclosure uh, has an effect. Absolutely. Uh, well, I've noticed pictures of, of that meditation room at the UN. It's a very odd looking room. Uh, and I've thought, well, maybe it's just an artsy thing. You know, somebody thought it would look good. But you're saying it really, it's really more than that. Nothing is by accident. Uh, that room is shaped that way because that is a place where they're to go basically to be inspired, to meditate, to be inspired by uh, denizens of, the, of hyperspace or the second heaven uh, on how to complete Nimrod's work in the earth. And I think one of the major proponents of completing it uh, is the UN, Freemasonry, uh, the Luciferian elite. Uh, they, they, it, it's almost like dealing with an octopus, but the, the, the very core head of it are certain bloodlines that you can lead all the way back to to Babylon. Your uh, introduction I'm looking at here on page one of your book it, it has an interesting title, A Journey Down the Rabbit Hole. Uh, <clears throat> Alice in Wonderland, everybody knows about Alice in Wonderland. Probably more behind that story than meets the eye. Uh, it's commonly billed as, as a kind of a child's uh, fairy tale, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But in fact, it it bears some striking resemblance to what's going on in the world. Yeah. It, it's sort of uh, myth condensed into child narrative. It is, and I, I thought it was appropriate for what we're doing. You know, God has us all on a journey. You know, I, I was saved at twelve, entered ministry at thirteen, went into the military, and, and God had me on different paths to where I had both military training, theological training. Uh, in the nineties, uh, we were confronted by the occult. I went for an extended period of spiritual warfare with them. Well, the military kicked in. I wanted to know the enemy. Mm-hmm. I wanted to understand their their war, their their doctrines of war, what they had planned, and uh, did a lot of intense study. In fact, some of the books after I read them, I burned them. They were just that profane. Mm. Uh, but when I did, I literally went down the rabbit hole. I began to discover that everything that we that we um, esteem as civility in this world is nothing but a veneer. And it has been placed there by the Luciferian elite to keep us contained and controlled while they do their work behind the scenes. Now you're not name calling, you're not pointing out this organization, that organization saying this is bad, these people are bad, those people are bad, but but rather you're, you're pointing to a system that's everywhere. Absolutely. But it comes up in different ways, has, it has different heads and different uh, manifestations. And, and again, even as I'm saying this, I wonder if I'm making myself perfectly clear because this is a very complicated issue. Absolutely. Uh, let's, let's take Freemasonry, for example. A lot of the men that are in it never go beyond the Blue Lodge. Uh, a lot of the things are not revealed. And in fact, Albert Pike in Morals and Dogma says we lie, basically, we lie to them and say all these symbols mean this, you know, it's a good, makes good men better. You don't understand the reality of what's really at the core until you get up into the higher levels. So, in fact, it could make good men better at a certain level. In other words, it, it, it teaches discipline, it teaches an honor code, uh, morals, ethics, and so forth and so on. So it could be said to be a beneficial organization. But at the same time there's that poison pill uh, (laughs) with it because their very first oath they take is at a trapezoid shaped altar. Word for word, step for step, what you become with the first degree in Freemasonry is the exact same ritual to become a witch. Okay. And they're not told that. Now, having established all this, and what what I want to do is make very clear uh, what your book is telling us, that there's something going on that we don't see and that we need to see. For example, Jesus said, love not the world, neither the things of the world. And you just finished saying a moment ago, uh, there are things in this world that appear beautiful and normal. Yes. But they're not. They are the things of this world. 
And so you're kind of agreeing with Jesus' uh, mandate there to, that we're not supposed to love the things of this world because behind them is this whole dark, hidden, concealed system. No matter how good it looks, there's this system behind it. And we're, we're called out of that. Uh, I think that's why the Apostle Paul uses Abraham so much in his example of us Gentiles coming out because uh, at the time of Abraham all the nations of the world were, were following the way of Babylon, if you will. In fact, Abraham was a citizen of Babylon. Yeah. His family's craft was making idols. God pulled him out, called him out to walk with him. That's exactly what we do with the gospel, is we call them out of that system. Once we're saved, we're strangers in a strange land, and we're looking for that city whose builder and maker is God. And we, we can't lose sight of that. You know, there was once a... Uh a, a very popular science fiction novel by the, with that title, Stranger in a Strange Land. And it was written by a man who, uh, basically a very good writer, a famous writer, not from a Christian or even a spiritual perspective at all, but he was trying to explain the world through the, the eyes of a science fiction writer. And essentially the message was, there are things here that you don't see. Uh, you have to look for a long time before you see what's really going on. And as we're talking, my Bible is still open to Genesis here, 10, 11, 12. And we looked at Genesis 10, Nimrod, Genesis 11, the tower. And as you go into Genesis 12, guess who's there? Abram. And the Lord picks him out, pulls him out of this idolatry from the land of Shinar, I guess, if you will. Yes. And, and makes him something entirely new. Isn't that, the, isn't that the gospel? I become a new creature. <laughs> to be a Hebrew means one who has passed over. I have left Babylon. I'm now walking in a new kingdom. Jesus said that the gospel of the kingdom would be preached. God's kingdom. Yeah. Not the kingdoms of this world, not the Babylonian system that was set up by Nimrod, but we're to walk separate. The Apostle John, which is the only one who really refers to the Antichrist, he says our problem is the world, the flesh, and the devil. There it is. In a, in a, all in a nice little package. We're talking with Dr. Michael Lake, and, and it's my pleasure to talk to Mike today about his book. We've spent a lot of time on foundation. And for the rest of this program, we're going to go a little deeper into the book, and, and then on the next program, we're going to go really deeply into the book. But I wanted you to understand where he's coming from on the Shinar Directive, extremely important message. In fact, all Christians should understand this, I, I believe. We've literally been hearing from people around the world that once they go through it, because I, I enter it as a teacher to help you connect the dots, once you go through it you never look at the world the same because you begin seeing what's behind the curtain. You know, we were talking a, a bit ago about men trying to build something to reach heaven. Now, not necessarily physically, but spiritually. Create some kind of a wormhole or a, um, <clears throat> maybe a portal. That kind of work is going on today. Science, as it's called, science is, is trying to, to build portals to reach that same place, right? They are probably one of the most famous as CERN. Uh, there, are, there are many particle accelerators being used around the world, but I think it's the largest and in my research I also discovered that uh, on their compound is the ruin of one of the oldest Apollyon or Apollo's temples. And so then you read in the book of Revelation there's a portal open and Apollyon comes out of it. Uh, they've even uh, discussed the, the, the ability to maybe open up a portal to another alternate universe or another dimensional reality. And uh, so there's, there's this inspiration that's going on behind the scenes, whether they realize it or not. There, is, there, are, there are dark forces, and you can have good men sometimes that are scientists that don't understand, that are being inspired uh, towards something that's really beyond their comprehension until they open the door and it's too late. And the door may be in the process of being opened right now, even as it was back in Genesis 11. In other words, there's nothing new no. <clears throat> here. This is the same old, same old. Same old, but I, I think in steroids. Uh, one of the things I postulate in the book is the elite knew that they could not complete their work until the return of the Watchers. And uh, when you look at the Book of Enoch, they were to be released probably at the beginning of the 20th century. 
I see in the 19th century they introduce eugenics, Darwinianism, spiritism, all these things that, cult, that basically were brought together that uh, basically empowered the Nazi movement. And all of a sudden you have this technological explosion which is the signature of the watchers. They knew that uh, it couldn't come to pass until all these things fell into place. Well, Mike, it is my pleasure to offer your book to our audience. It's called The Shinar Directive, Dr. Michael Lake. And believe me, we haven't even scratched the surface of this book. We have laid out the thesis of the book. So I think if you're watching us today, you'll know what the book is about. But there is detail in here that we haven't even touched, right? and a lot of it, uh, I should say. It's not about science fiction. What this book is about is about Christianity. It is about your walk with the Lord. It is about uh, making you aware of the kind of world you're walking in. And I think uh, Mike does a great job of that. Uh, we're offering Shine Our Directive for 1995, but it's also going to come with a free, that's F-R-E-E, -E, <laughs> bonus uh, DVD. Or this is a, is this a DVD? It's, it's a, a data DVD. CD, all right, which means that it's got a lot of, uh, of material on it. Tell us about the material on this DVD. I wanted to provide the family with, with a basic library. I have over a hundred uh, different books. Some of them are Christian classics. Uh, some of them are books on Freemasonry and stuff where they can begin building their library, doing their own research. Mm -hmm. uh, also, since I had almost five gigabyte to work with, with it being a data DVD, uh, I included... Uh, over 80 one-hour uh, sessions that I've done at MP3. Many of them are seminars, so they have PDF study guides that'll take them right through the lectures. And uh, we've got as many great responses off of that as we have the book. Wow. How about that? Shine Our Directive 1995 with this free bonus disc. Hours of material, a lot of research material on it. Uh, also, I want to uh, mention that you can subscribe to our magazine. The Prophecy Watcher for 1995, or uh, we still have the charter subscription, the lifetime subscription to this magazine from now until the rapture, $100. Take advantage of that. By the way, I, I want to mention uh, on page 23 of this magazine, there's a full page about our upcoming prophecy conference in July featuring live streaming video. The conference itself is sold out but you can still subscribe to live streaming video, state-of-the-art, HD, you'll see all the speakers, and uh, it's gonna be a wonderful experience. Again, avail yourself of the Shinar Directive, Dr. Michael Lake. And Mike, I feel like we just need to talk another hour or two, but we're gonna come back and do another program with you because I wanna get into the nuts and bolts of the Shinar Directive. That would be wonderful. And it's been a pleasure today. Uh, and edifying for me. Thanks for being here. It's been a blessing. I'm Gary Stearman. You know, we're watching. You keep watching too. We'll see you soon. Thanks for joining us on Prophecy Watchers. You can find us on the web at prophecywatchers.com where you can sign up for our free email newsletter. In the meantime, keep watching everybody and we'll see you soon.